We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, let's jump right into our text in, in just a, a moment. We're going to be talking, or giving a comparison, if you will, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Esau. How many uh, think Esau was a great and famous, uh, powerful example from the Old Testament? Well, absolutely, he was the example of the wrong thing. Uh, he was that one who lived in the moment. And after we've gone through this entire chapter of faith, he's going to use this and saying, since we have all of these people of faith that are cheering us on, let us run with perseverance. Perseverance is the exact opposite of somebody who sees a problem and lives in the temporary moment and is blown away by the waves of the, uh, uh, that are out there in the ocean. The wind moves them back and forth. James talks to us about those people. Uh, and Esau was one of those who come comes in and it's crazy. I, I was just thinking about the text. He comes in and he says, what good is a birthright to me if I'm at the point of death? Now, I don't know what was going on in his life. I can't give some specifics on how long it had been since he had eaten last, but he was out hunting. He was out moving, and I understand that when you've expended a lot of energy, you can feel like your blood sugar level has dropped down and, and, and you're famished or what have you. But to say that you're at the point of death, it just seems to me like an exaggeration. He lives so much in the moment that if we were to go on and talk about Esau in comparison to the writers in the New Testament, they refer to him as sensual and secular and, and living only for his passions and his momentary desires. And the people of faith live just the opposite of that. People of faith live a disciplined and trained life. And this is what the author of Hebrews is trying to convey to us. He's saying, look, uh, since we have all of these people of faith that are around us, since we have all of this encouragement, we need to run the race accordingly. So let's go to our text. And it says in chapter 12, verse 1, I'll read the first three verses, and, and then we'll do some analysis uh, after that. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the, the cross, scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We're talking about, and I use as a title over over today, a uh, faith that ends the race or that, that finishes the course. In other words, we see Jesus as this author, the perfecter of this faith that enables us to have endurance. So here we have this great cloud of witnesses as is listed here. Our journey of faith has, has this, uh, this idea behind it that it's something that's a journey. It's a pilgrimage. It's something that's long lasting. It's not a hundred meter dash. It's not the, the instantaneous uh, uh, run for the race and then 10 seconds later, 12 seconds if you're slow, uh, it finishes and, and, and uh, that's all there is to it. But rather requires a discipline and an endurance. Recently, well, I I guess uh, over the last uh, couple of years, I've gotten more and more into, into running. And when I mean running, I don't mean the 100 meter dash, I mean jogging and so forth. And uh, just uh, a month or so ago, I uh, actually invested in a, in a treadmill for my house because running out on the uh, cobblestone streets and so forth is, uh, had proven dangerous to my ankles and knees and, and all kinds of stuff. But uh, average running uh, between five and six kilometers a day. And that's uh, when I first started off, that seemed like a, a dream. I mean, how could you possibly keep going for that long? You, you jog for, for 500 meters and then you walk and then you jog for another 500 meters and then you walk. But it gets to a place where your endurance builds up. And this is what the, the writer of Hebrews is trying to say. It's time to build up the endurance. And he uses this example of this historical uh, race, if you will. You know, the Olympics isn't something that just happened uh, in our recent history. If we were to go back into uh, history, we find out that the Olympic races began in 776 BC. 
And uh, if you were to start to take those runners in, in Olympia, uh, Greece, they would gather together in the big stadiums and they would all watch these runners. And the one reason why they would gather together to watch the runners was because these runners had lived a disciplined life. They had done what was necessary for them to be able to run and beat everybody else. And all of these spectators would be around to watch these runners. They had done, gone into strict training. They were runners day in and day out to be able to make sure that they were going to be able to do it. But they also cared for their diet. They wanted to lose the excess fat, all of the things that would go hand in hand with being able to run quickly. And so we have these examples of these Olympic athletes. And then the writer comes along and he says, you know what, since you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, what's the great cloud of witnesses that, that he was referring to? The great cloud of witnesses that he's referring to is obviously those that he just listed in Hebrews 11, but also uh, all the people around us. You know, the people that are right here in the sanctuary with us, they're our witnesses, they're watching. And if you were to use that example of the Olympic athletes, the, the stadium would be filled. There was always this group of people that were watching. Uh, when Paul writes to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5, it says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you all also. So these witnesses can be the people of the Old Testament, can be the people of the New Testament, but they could also be our church family, our friends, our personal, our, our blood family, if you will. All of these people are our witnesses. And then he goes on and he says this phrase here in our text. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now notice the word, the, con the conjunction there, and. These are not the same thing. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And uh, it's not that these things are bad, that they're sin, if you will, but rather they're just hindrances. They're hindrances. And in the Olympic athletes, the runners, they would have taken off all of these things. And sometimes those Olympic athletes actually ran without any clothing at all. Uh, because they didn't want anything that was going to slow them down, anything that, that could get in the way, if you will. And so they would go into this strict training, and then when it was time for the race, they made sure that everything was taken off of them so that they could run with perseverance. They could run the long race and not get tired out. You know, a, a quick race, you may not notice the difference between a piece of clothing or not, but when you're over the long haul, and, and nowadays with, our, with technology, we have uh, solar cars, for example, and electric cars, and they go into these wind tunnels to be able to make sure that they're as aerodynamic as possible to conserve as much energy to be able to get the distance out. In other words, what the writer here is telling us is that the race isn't the sprint, but rather the marathon. It reminds us, obviously, of the story of the tortoise and the hare. Uh, it's not how fast you can run, but how much perseverance you have, how long you can... Uh, how long it is that you are going to be able to continue to move and run forward. You know, I'm reminded of the, of the phrase that uh, tells us that a spoonful of perseverance is worth a bucket load of talent. Uh, it, it, somebody that's willing to just continue and press on and try and do the best and every time they fall and they get back up and they continue to move forward. These are the types of people that the Lord is calling us to be. These athletes then that were the example of the Olympic athletes, he was saying, now you be that kind of a person. Go into strict training. Later on, in just a few moments, we're going to use the word discipline because God disciplines those who are his children. But uh, sometimes we don't like the term discipline. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, when I was a child, I didn't like the term discipline. When I was a parent, it didn't bother me nearly as much. And uh, the reality is, is that when we are ch God's children, we could think of that as a negative thing. But what I want to use, rather than the term of a father disciplining as, as well uh, in such a way as, as a spanking, or these, these ideas that we have of discipline, is more along the lines of a personal trainer. 
the personal trainer who's trying to help you achieve your goal. Your goal is to run and be the best believer that you can be. And so God comes along in his Holy Spirit and he's the personal trainer. In other words, he's enabling us to take out everything that's going to hinder us from being able to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. If we want to run that 5K, if you, if you will, we need to make sure that we do certain things throughout the day, throughout the week, in order to be able to get to that as the end goal. And that requires discipline, self-discipline. And the trainer will go in and sometimes with new people that are, that are saying, I just need to recover. I, I, we have these personal trainers and they help us. They make sure that our form, our, 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 we're doing it, the exercises the right way. They may help us set up the right diet and so forth. It's not because it was a big problem for us to have that occasional ice cream cone. But if the, if the plan was for us to win the Olympics, the ice cream cone wasn't all that important. And so when he says here that he wants to take out everything that would, would hinder us, he's saying all of these things that we have sometimes a little bit too much of. You know, as believers, it's not a problem to, and, and I'll go out on a limb, it's not a problem to have a television, watch a television show. But there becomes a problem for some believers when they watch too much television. <laughs> Hello? And not a problem that uh, you have a hobby. It becomes a problem when it becomes consuming. And so what the writer here says is take out everything that hinders. One of the things that Jesus talks about uh, in John 15, 1 through 2, let me read it. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. The goal is that we produce for the Lord. That's what God's plan is. And so when he is saying, I want to take off all of these things that would hinder me, it's like that sucker on the, on the, the fruit bearing tree or the tomato plant or the vine, if you will. They never produce any fruit, but it sucks up kind of some of the life. And there's Christians who spend an exorbitant amount of time in things that aren't necessarily sin, but they hinder them from running the race that God has put before it. And so the writer here comes in and he says, I let us throw off everything that hinders. It may be too much to eat, too much, to, too much sleep. It may be uh, too much internet, too much television, too much. Uh, I mean, all of these things that we can say, there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. But too much becomes a problem. And then he says, and the sin that so easily entangles. They are two separate things here in, in this particular connection. And when we go into the second thing, the sin that so easily entangles, if you have things that are on your life, it can, sin ends in death. The, the, the wages of sin is death. Let me give you an example of something that would be easily entangled. We have in the Old Testament a character by the name of Absalom. Remember Absalom? He was famous for his beautiful hair. I and mean, when he cut it, everyone would gather around and say, how much did it weigh this year? You know? And that was something that could cause a problem. Matter of fact, in 2 Samuel 18, Verse 9, it says, Now Aslam happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. Now, I would say that that's probably something that easily entangles. That's what I use in my memory, in my, in my thoughts. I, I, there's, there's things that we have to do to try to make sure that we don't get tangled. A couple of weeks ago, my family spent a, a little bit of time on the beach. And uh, one of the things that we have to be very careful with is my daughter's hair. Before we can go out to the beach, uh, it is braided in a very tight braid to be able to make sure that it doesn't end up becoming this knotted mess because it could get so tangly and so much a problem. We spend money on, on expensive conditioners to make sure that, though, that that doesn't happen, but it can and it does happen on occasion. And we have to be careful not to allow the tangles to overcome. So in reading on in verse 10, it says, when one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Well, that's kind of probably a spectacle. It says, 
Job said to the man who told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, Even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. But there he was hanging. And you know that it ended up causing his death. Because when we have things that so easily entangle us, when we have these sins upon us, there's a problem. Paul also told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.4, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. These are the t entanglements, the things that were just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of sin. It, it, some people say, oh, that's just a little bit. Nobody will ever be hurt by that little bit. And I, I've heard the statement, and I'm sure you have as well, the response, how much is a little bit? How, if somebody says, this is just a little bit of poison. Uh, you go ahead and take it. Uh, a little bit can hurt. And so... The writer here, he says to us these things. He says, look, I want you to make sure that you throw off, like those Olympic athletes, taking off all of this clothing, making sure it wasn't a problem, the clothing, but taking off everything that would hinder them from running as fast as they could. Anything that would slow them down because they had one focus. And as the church, what's our one focus? To proclaim Jesus. To proclaim Jesus. And so he says, throw off everything that would hinder you. Any pastime, any distraction, anything that would gather your attention, throw that, that stuff off. And then he says, and then the sin that so easily entangles, make sure you get rid of it. Don't allow anything that would hinder you. Now, you, can, you could go back to that example I just gave of Absalom. Now, what, would he, what could he have done before he went into battle? If you have a problem with your hair getting tangled in trees... <laughs> What would, what would be the wise thing? Get the haircut before you go to, to war, right? I mean, he knew how often he had to get a haircut. And he didn't do it. He wanted you know, that, that, that hair blowing in the wind look. And uh, I'm the great warrior and, and so forth. Who knows what was going on in his mind. But his hair was such that it got tingled up into the, the tree branches. And it caused his death. And if we just uh, put off getting rid of that sin... Oh, well, I'll repent tomorrow. It, tomorrow, very well, may be too late. And he says, and, and let us run with perseverance, not run with speed, necessarily. He says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. It is important that we understand that the race that we have before us is one of perseverance. And so we can uh, use that to understand a little bit deeper in a deeper way, some of the other things that the Word of God it tells us and, and teaches us. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You know, one of the things that I associate with perseverance is patience. You can't, you can't be a person of great endurance and perseverance if you don't have patience. If you go in and you say, Well, I have to be this marathon athlete tomorrow... You know what you're going to find out? You aren't going to be a marathon athlete tomorrow. It requires patience. It's a plan, a long-term project with great perseverance and therefore great patience. But we're also told that the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. We have the patience that's required of us to move forward. Perseverance is always, always something that ends up winning the race. You know, the greatest students aren't necessarily the students that are the valedictorian. They're not the students that go into college with the best grades from high school, but rather the best students are the ones that make it to the end and graduate. You know, if you start to look at the statistics in many of the universities, they have the incoming freshmen here at this level, and then the next year they have this many students in the, in the sophomore year, and then the junior year, and then the senior year, and then the graduates. Why is that? Because 
Everyone wants to show up and have that great, oh man, I'm going to go and we're going to have parties. We're going to get to know a lot of people. We're going to have friends. We're going to have all of these things. But they don't have the perseverance required to be able to finish the race. And as I said earlier, just a spoonful of perseverance is worth a bucket load, even of brain power. Uh, the smartest people in the world sometimes can't finish the course because they simply don't have the perseverance. And so it says here that we need to then fix our eyes on Jesus. While we are running, we fix our eyes on Jesus. It's impossible to put your eyes and focus them on two things at a time. Well, I understand that we as, uh, as humans have what is called peripheral vision, but you can only focus on one thing at a time. You can't focus. And you say, oh, no, I can focus on two things at a time. You know what you do? You end up doing nothing well. I remember uh, watching a television program uh, that was highlighting these, high, uh, these people who could multitask very well. And the one point they said, you know what, they say they multitask and it shouldn't be a problem for them to drive and talk on the phone at the same time. And so they put them on a closed uh, uh, course and had all of this stuff flying out at them where they had to weave around this, this course as a driver and have a conversation. And at the end, they said, see, told you, we did great. And then they played back the audio. Every time a thing would jump out at them, all of a sudden their conversation with the person on the phone would stop as they had to refocus and change the focus from one to another. They're not multitasking. They're not doing two things at the same time. They're just switching their focus from one to another frequently enough where they feel like they're doing both well. But what they're doing is neither of them 100%. And so Jesus is to be our focus. It's not to be the pastime. It's not to be the sin. It's not to be the things that would slow us down. But we focus our attention on Jesus. When did Peter have a problem? Matthew 14, 29, Jesus says to him, come. He's walking on the water. And Peter says, that looks like fun. I want to do that. And Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. If a disciple that had been with Jesus already... A disciple who was there, one of those who gathered up the broken pieces of the, uh, after feeding the multitude. If a disciple who had all of those experiences with Jesus in the middle of the worst and furious storm with the waves blowing could be distracted, that also is a temptation for us as disciples. And so the writer here of Hebrews says, if you're going to run the fast race or the long-term race, you have to end up with a perseverance and have your eyes fixed on one and only one thing. I'm reminded of the story of the person who was, was uh, in a uh, personal aircraft, uh, one of those kind of ultralights, if you will, and it crashed in the middle of the desert out in Utah. And he looked around and he said, I, I, he couldn't see anything. I mean, he was in the middle of the uh, salt flats and, and all of the heat and, and so forth. And he couldn't see anything except for one mountain at a distance. And he knew that there was a town uh, next to the only mountain in the area. He couldn't see the town because he was so far away, but he could see the mountain. And so what did he do? Did he wander around aimlessly in the desert hoping to find water? He looked at the mountain. He said, if I keep walking in that direction, I'll be okay. And as long as he kept, 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 he kept his eyes fixed on where he was supposed to go, he didn't have a problem. That's who we need to be. We need to be the people who keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. If we're steadfast, trusting in God, we need to have that, that ability to move forward for the long haul. Jesus didn't call us to be a Christian for the day. He's not calling us to be day workers, but rather lifetime, lifelong disciples, believers. 
We need to remember all the time Jesus and his example. What kind of example did Jesus leave for us? Jesus left an example of perseverance. When he saw the problems coming, he kept going in the right direction. All of the circumstances around him didn't dissuade him, didn't turn him from one side to the other, but rather he continued to focus on his goal. So we keep as Jesus as our focus. You know, when we keep Jesus as our focus, no matter what happens, we can continue the race. We can continue and move forward. In Acts 7, we have the story of Stephen, the first martyr. Remember, remember Stephen? Stephen looked around and he saw all the people throwing rocks and he got scared, right? No, that's not what the scriptures say. He looked up and he said, look, I see the Son of God, Son of Man. And everyone got angry with him. And what did he do? He saw the glory of God. And what did he do as a result of having his eyes in the right spot? Not only did he give up his life, but he also followed the example of Jesus, who forgave even from the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. That was, his, that was the natural response of having had his eyes on Jesus. He had a couple of secrets that I want to remind you of. First of all, the scriptures clearly say that he was full of the Holy Spirit. We need to walk full of the Holy Spirit. How do you stay full of the Holy Spirit? Making sure that you have nothing that's holding you back. We focus. This is my life. The Olympic runners said, this is my life. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the fastest. I'm going to, be the, I'm going to win the Olympics. And as believers, we need to take and get rid of all of the things that would, would slow us down. Prune us of all of the sins so that we could do what God wants us to do. So the discipline of God can come upon us. Not that discipline as a harsh taskmaster, but the discipline as a father. The discipline as the trainer who says, you could do it. You can continue on. Going back to our text, then we pick up in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a, fa as a father addresses his sons? Or son, he says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. I want to tell you that there's a great difference between the word discipline here and the, uh, the punishment, if you will, in the Old Testament. When God sees the, the uh, promised land and they're full of all of these other uh, nations and he says, I'm going to punish them, I'm going to destroy them. That was not like a son. But here it's this loving con correction, this loving ability to move forward and be somebody that God wants us to be. The discipline of the Lord then trains us so that we can run the race in a better way. We can run with discipline. Discipline that isn't because we, we are rebels, but rather discipline because we want to move and go better. You know, the trainer, the, the most joyous uh, Clients, I guess you would say, for a trainer are the ones that want to do it. There's a lot of people that show up at, at the gym and they hire a personal trainer and say, oh, I'm really committed. But tomorrow, they're not nearly as committed. And when it's time to have the meal planning, they show that their commitment level wasn't as much as they, it might have been. You know, and these people are, uh, the trainers are there because they're paying me. But it's not a joy for them. The, the teachers who have joy in, the, in their students are the students that do the best. I was watching uh, a show of Andy Griffith and, uh, and Opie comes in and he says, I'm not worried about my homework because I think the teacher likes me. <laughs> and and uh, he says, you know, Opie, liking you has nothing to do with it. You have to do the work. No, I know that liking means uh, something of good grades because so-and-so is the teacher's pet. She loves that person, and she always gets A's. And Andy says to Opie, will you ever think that the reason why she likes, you know, the teacher likes that student so much is because she studies and gets the good grades? <laughs> That's who we are. 
We are pleasing to the Lord when we strive and we want to get rid of all of these other things. We respond to the discipline, the training experience. James 1 verses 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, not because you're masochists. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, why are we considering that joy? Because we know that that's God helping us be trained so that we could run with perseverance, that we could do what we, want, we need to do in Him. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We need to be these people who are persevering, moving forward with that example that, G, that is Jesus. If we go back to our text. It says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not, are not disciplined by their fathers? We don't beat them. You know, I, I can remember hearing one preacher, and he must have been kind of an obstinate little boy. He has I remember him saying that his father would come in and his father was, was a gentle man and uh, really represented God. And his father would come in and say, now son, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it's going to hurt you. And the boy would look up to his father and say, dad, don't put yourself through it. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, <laughs> that didn't work. Because the father, although it broke his heart, wasn't to beat the child, but rather so that the child can be who he was intended to be. And so he says, if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Those of prosperity teaching who think that they'll never have a problem, they, they must think that God doesn't treat them as a child. But we, as people uh, that are wanting to grow, we encourage God to come along and continue to modify us. The most trained athletes end up with more and more highly skilled trainers. If you go into professional athletes, and at their level, the trainers or the coaches have an exceptional ability to be able to fine-tune the abilities and talents of them. You don't find those exceptional uh, coaches at the high school level, but the best of the high school who go on to college end up with a coach that trains them and gets them to an even greater level, who after that, the coach can hand them over to these new professionals, and they have these high Highly, train, highly skilled trainers. And even at those levels, they have specialists who say, I do nothing except for focus if, if you were on the, uh, in a football field, for example, only on the linemen, only on the quarterback, only on the kickers, only on... And, and they have this focus, this laser focus, to be able to make sure that that person becomes the absolute best. Now, I have a, a good word for you. We have the best trainer in the Holy Spirit. And God is going to continue to hone us. No matter how far we get down the training process, we have a continued ability. One of the things uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I have a, a treadmill. And they have this new application. It's a virtual uh, program that you can connect various pieces of equipment with your treadmill. And, and it, it measures the incline of your treadmill, the pace. It even has a camera that looks at your, your stride and so forth. And the virtual trainer will come on and make recommendations on how you should push off different this way, doing that, these things. And all with the goal of making you be able to be a better runner. All virtual right now. It's incredible. And the same thing, the Holy Spirit comes along and says, moreover, in verse 9, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. The reason for the training of the Holy Spirit is that we also would walk in holiness. That we get rid of all those other things that would distract us. In verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. You take any athlete that's out there running, and the coach says, one more lap. I remember when I was in high school on a football team, and they would say, one more uh, uh, back and forth with burpees. And, and, and I, I, everyone, everyone on the team would give the same response. Oh, 
And for some reason, for some reason, the coach never got the cue. Never said, oh, in that case, if you don't want to go, it's okay, hit the showers. He never brought out the tray of donuts for us. Never tried to make himself uh, more favorable in our eyes. Never. And he kept explaining, explaining it to us. He would say, you know what? The choice is yours. Do you want to be football players or not? Do you want to win or not? And if you want to win, you need to do this. You don't want to win? You can go on in. And when we would go, oh, again? He say, anyone who doesn't want to win, who doesn't want to be on this football team, you can go in. You know what? It was crazy. Nobody left. The incredible peer pressure of high school, you know? Nobody left. We never gathered together and say, you know what, if we all walked off the field, you think that, the, that he wouldn't want us back because after all, this is his job. Never dawned on us. But with the Holy Spirit, he's wanting our very best. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. You know, when I was out there on the, on the football field and, and being trained and so forth, and I, I hated it, but when my name showed up in the newspaper, it seemed a little bit less painful. You know what I'm saying? Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. You have to move forward. You have to go into training. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So this is our encouragement to submit ourselves to our Father who is training us. So the responsibilities and privileges that we have in knowing Jesus, the, the, the NIV version says here above verse 4, 14, warning and, and encouragement. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so make every effort to live at peace. Now, that's within our ability, obviously. You can't live at peace with people who want to be always hostile. But we have certain obligations. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of of God. In Matthew 5 verses 23 and 24, therefore if you are offering your gift at an altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So peace and, and living at peace with others is something that God wants from us. In Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we live at peace with others that our conscience isn't constantly attacking us. But then it says to live in holiness, in holiness. Now, holiness is comprised of two separate parts. If you were to look at holiness, you have the part that is my job and the part that is God's job. The part that I have a responsibility to do and the part that God is doing in me. The first step of justification. Uh, this is, this is uh, what God proves out. And he says, I have done this. I am doing this in you. Romans 4, 5 mentions this. And then we have that process of regeneration. It's something that is given to us. That's still God doing it. But the sanctification, this process, it's a series of events in our lives that we cooperate with. When God says, get up and run, as the good trainer we get up and run. We do the things required of us to walk out that holiness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Do you hear our part in that? Let us, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body. We have a part to play in this. And so here also in Hebrews, he's highlighting the same thing. We already mentioned it back in verse 10. It says, they, dis they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. It's our 
participation. And so we read in verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's an important aspect. We want to keep our eyes. We want to see Jesus. He is the one. We are the ones that are required to have our eyes fixed on him. As we mentioned earlier, Peter had to have his eyes fixed on Jesus, didn't he? And God's call for us is to be holy. In 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, except for on Monday and Tuesday. No, that's not what it says. In all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is our obligation. This is who we are supposed to be. And so we move and we see that we have a part to play in our holiness. You know, and we don't want to fall short of that grace that God has for us. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now notice what he says here. Make sure you no one falls short. There's a lot of people, a lot of teachers in, in churches that say that grace, you can't, you can't reject it. You're going to, uh, grace is, is, is something that God offers. It has nothing to do with you. That's a false teaching. Because here, clearly, we see that grace is something that God is extending to us. And we can say, no, I, want, I don't want that. Or yes, I do want it. If we read in our context here. It says, make sure, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Again, we go back to the things that we can permit in our lives. Now, where do bitter roots come from, typically? Typically, a bitter root comes from a past experience. We don't normally have a bitter root grow up in our lives. My experience as a pastor for a number of years isn't that people have a bitter root because they hear a story of some injustice that happened in Africa. A bitter root typically is something that we have had happen to us and then we meditate on that and we say that's just not right. God should have done something different and we permit a bitter root. Well, if we go back to the very beginning of our study today, what the writer says is let us take off everything that would hinder us. We have a choice of what we focus on what we meditate on, our heart's desire. It goes on in verse 16, see to it, see that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Here we have Esau mentioned. That you just desire the temporary things. That you don't understand that God has a long-term project that he's using us for. Faith enables us to move forward. And he goes on, he's talking, talking about Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. And notice what it says here. What he had done. If you go back into that story, there was a birthright and there was a blessing. And you could say that the blessing was something that was stolen. Remember how mom comes along and he says, oh, Sonny, my youngest, my favorite. And here, let me dress you up because Esau's gone out to hunt and you can get the blessing of, of, of your father. You remember the story? And he, she puts on uh, sheep skin, uh, lambskins on, on, on his arms and, and dresses him in Esau's clothing and he fools his dad into giving him a blessing. But what does it say here? It says he could not change what he had done. He had, uh, had put down, he had thought it small, this blessing. There's actually a, a Jewish story, if you will of Jacob and Esau they, who had a conversation already in the, uh, still in the womb before they were born. And Jacob, according to the, the Jewish legend, Jacob told Esau, look, uh, the area that we're about ready to go into is comprised of two phases. The first phase of everything you see, all the things that you could enjoy. And then there's a later phase later on that, that uh, you can't see, but it lasts a little bit longer. He says, I'll make you a deal. You choose the, the temporary, permanent, or temporary, immediate stuff, and I'll choose the latter one. What do you think? And he says, oh, that sounds good to me. More or less, that's what the, the, the story goes. 
And why? Because they highlighted the fact that Esau sold what he wanted for something temporary, something that was passing. And it says here clearly that he had done it. He had said this wasn't as high of an importance as it might have been. He did it to himself. But notice what it says here. That it says, even though he sought the blessing with tears. You remember the story? Esau wept before Isaac and he was but dad, don't you have a blessing? Don't you have more than one blessing? Can't you give me? I, and, and dad says, well, I already made you servant to your, your brother. I already did all this. And he gives him the list of things. He says, don't you have anything? He wept. You know, there's certain things that if we don't run with perseverance, you can never recover. Re recover. You know, I, I remember being a, a youth pastor and talking to, to youth. And they would say, well, can God forgive me for me being promiscuous? Yes, God could forgive you but he doesn't restore the virginity. There's certain things that it, 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 God doesn't offer any of us the opportunity to just go back in time. Let's try that, let's try that one more time. You can't recover. And he says here that even though he was weeping over it, in other words, you have to make your decision now. You can't get to the end of your life and say, oh, you know what, I guess I went down the wrong path. Let me go back and try that over again. In, in golf, there's such a term as a mulligan. There's no such term in God's eyes. What's a mulligan? Uh, I didn't like where ball went that time. Let me just hit it again from here, you know? And that doesn't work. You can't just go back and pretend like it didn't happen. God doesn't operate that way. And so he says, these are the things that we need to do. Make sure you don't fall short of the grace of God. Live with perseverance right now. This is our obligation, that we live with that perseverance and we don't give up. In verse 18, you have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched and that is burning with fire to, dar to darkness, gloom, and storm to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged for no further word to be spoken to them because they did not bear what was they could not bear what was commanded even if even an animal touched the mountain it must be stoned to death the sight was so terrifying that Moses said I am trembling with fear we're obviously talking about uh, Sinai Mount Sinai as everyone gathered around and everyone said, no, Moses, you go. He says, we're not living on that mountain. That's not the way that we are living right now. But rather, we have this privilege to live on Mount Zion. We have this great contrast of the sadness, of the darkness, of the gloom, of, of the pain that was in Sinai in comparison with Zion, who, where we see this clarity and this joy that is ours. And God is inviting us into this relationship with him. He goes on and says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven you have come to God the judge of all to the spirits of the righteous made perfect to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel and so here in this text we, we are contrasting again the old with the new and the joy that is ours if we just stay the course see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks they said, I don't want it because it's too scary. And, and here in the New Testament, sometimes we have this misperception amongst the church who says, well, God's a God of love. I can just do whatever he wants and he, uh, whatever I want, and he won't do anything about it because after all, he wouldn't condemn me. And he clearly is saying here that we have this ability to refuse, even when it's in a joyful manner. We could refuse and we could have a problem. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that removing, uh, the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that 
what cannot be shaken may remain. Notice here in Mount Sinai, the earth shook. The God comes down and everything is shaking and trembling and they see these billows of smoke and, and all of this stuff that's terrifying to them. But here, the new is going to have a shaking that's not only on earth, but in heaven as well. Everything is shaken. Since then, we are, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, if everything is shaken up, everything that isn't, isn't long-lasting and able to, to stand the test, that's what's going to be the solid. Jesus looked at Peter, and after Peter had said, you are the Son of God, he says, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, what does he mean when he says that rock, the rock that cannot be shaken? What's well, going to last and all of the things that we could be distracted with and not running with, with, with perseverance. All of the things that, that would entangle us, the sins. And all of the pastimes that, that may be okay and not sinful, but they just distract us. All of these things, if we enable ourselves to get distracted with all of those things, they're going to be shaken and they're going to be gone. And we're going to say, oh, I'm lost. What's happening? But if we fix our lives over and build our lives over the rock, when the storms come, when the earth shakes, once again, Jesus used it is that parable the wise man built his house on the rock and when the storms came and hit that that house it didn't fall but the foolish man built his house on the sand and you remember what happened when the storms came great was the crash that's what Jesus says. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, built on that rock, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Our trainer is constantly motivating us. And what a blessing to God as we have an ear inclined to hear him that says, yes, I can do it. When he says, one more lap, we say, I can do it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we have a problem, when we have a difficulty, our eyes don't get fixated on the issue, but rather on Jesus. When we're walking on the water and the storms around us are blowing and it's tempting to get our eyes off of Jesus, we can fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who was the endurer. He is the one that showed us the path. I remember hearing a story of a father and a son who were, were walking along and, and it was a very precarious route on the edge of a mountain and everywhere it seemed like you'd, you'd want to step was a, 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 some rock that was loose and you would slip and fall out. And eventually the father in front who had a little bit more wisdom would continue to walk and the son behind said, Dad, make sure that you take small steps because I'm putting my feet wherever you do. That's who we have to be with Jesus, who was the author and perfecter of our faith, who marked out the race before us, how to endure, how to persevere through all of the problems. And in the middle of all the problems, we don't have to be distracted. We can just keep our eyes on those steps where Jesus is, and we can walk it out and live the way that Jesus wants us to live. Why do we have to live by faith? Because faith enables us to run the long run to be the ones with perseverance and finish the course. Because it's not about how many start. Every year, well, not this year because we had problems in our world, but every year there's such thing as the Boston Marathon and the New York Marathon. And I looked it up. I don't have the exact numbers here, but every year it's uh, approximated of only 30% of those who start the marathon finish. And you would think that they would have prepared. But no, there's a lot of people who show up, people who live in the city. Oh, I, you know, give me the number. I, and what do they really want? They register so that they can hang on their wall at home that they were registered as, a, a, as one of the marathon runners, of the Boston Marathon, you know? They never expected to, they didn't even try to win. They didn't try to finish. There was only a select handful that ends up being out in front and run the complete race because they have the perseverance, because they have trained. And so we as the church have all of these people around us encouraging us to train and continue on because we have a long race to run and God is wanting us to win, to finish the course. And everyone's going to stand up and say, Woo, good job when we make it because God has been training us. See, Lord, thank you 
for your blessings upon us. That we would run with perseverance, absolute confidence in our trainer, not in ourselves, but the one that has been training us, has prepared us precisely for this moment that we're at. We can have confidence because we have done what you have told us to do. We have kept our eyes on you throughout the last years as we've been trained. And now when many have their faith collapsing in the problems that our world is facing, we can have confidence because we have the perseverance, because we've done everything that our trainer has told us to do. Let that be our confidence. We thank you, Jesus, for giving us the heart of a champion, the one who moves forward and is going to be more than a conqueror in you. Pray for your blessing upon your church and those who are here as well as watching from afar. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you here on, on Sunday at 10 o'clock.